Pickle Kids. For this week's video, I decided I'd do something a little different and share some of the best tips I've learned for Paint Tool Sai. Now, a little backstory, I've been using Sai ever since my friend sent me a totally legit copy about five years ago so we could do a meme together, and while Sai is known for being simpler than, say, Photoshop, it was still a pretty steep learning curve for someone who'd previously only had experience with MS Paint and GIMP, and personally, I had a hard time finding any good resources back in the day, so now that I'm a little more experienced, or at the very least a pro at faking it, I've decided to throw together this video of things I wish I'd known when I started using Sai. First, let's start off with the basics. Opening a fresh new canvas, just press file and bam! Options. This is literally just where you're going to decide how big your canvas is. Now, when I first started doing digital art, I'd always work on these really teeny tiny canvases, which made it super difficult to do any detail work. On top of that, I found that working on a bigger canvas makes my art look so much cleaner, because when you view the full image, all the mistakes are too small to see until you zoom into 100% and then it's like, damn Melody, do you even know how to draw a smooth line? And no. No, I do not. Anyway, I usually tend to work between 1000 to 2000 pixels each way for doodles, and somewhere between 2000 to 4000 for more complex work. At the bottom there, you'll notice a bar that says resolution with a number and a click down menu that says pixels per inch. Now, you may have heard the phrase DPI or PPI floating around. These stand for dots per inch or pixel per inch, respectively. It's basically how many individual pixels will fit onto one square inch of your page when you print the image. As far as I'm aware, you don't have to worry about this inside unless you're planning to print your image or if you want to set up your page based on inches instead of pixels. Regardless of whether you're printing, it's good to get into the habit of working somewhere between 200 to 400 dpi. Now that we're done with all that boring number business, it's time to get to painting. But wait, Melody! You say in that little voice of yours. Your totally and completely illegitimate copy of Psy doesn't look the same as my totally and completely illegitimate copy of Psy. And that's probably because of my fancy floating windows. Now, this is totally optional. You can keep your Psy interface as it is if you'd like. But if you want fancy floating windows like mine, all you have to do is close Psy, open up where you've installed it on your computer, and find misc.ini. From here, you're going to change the settings to this, save the file, and open Psy. This is especially great if you're like me and living that single monitor life, because you can drag the windows out of the Psy screen, put them over the top of your show, and BAM! Clean workspace. Okay, but now it's time for painting, right? Sure, once we make sure to set our stabilizer. The stabilizer can make your line smoother and fix any micro mistakes your hand might make. I usually keep mine set at 7, but play around with it to see what works best for you. For realsies though, it is time to get into art making. First things first, we have two different layer options, regular or line art. I personally don't tend to use the line art layer, but it can be incredibly useful, especially if you don't have a tablet or just want your art to look cleaner. What makes a line art tool special is that you can edit a line after you've drawn it. The draw tool lets you free draw a line, while the curve tool lets you draw a line with a curve to it, and the line tool draws a straight line. If you want to edit any of the points on your lines, or add more points, you can use the edit tool and click anywhere on the line. The weight tool will change the thickness of the full line, while the pressure tool will change the thickness of one specific segment of the line by dragging right or left, and color changes the line colors. It's pretty intuitive, to be honest. But let's say we're working on a normal layer type. If you look at your toolbar, you'll have a ton of tools. I can't explain all of them because I don't understand all of them, but I will walk you through the main ones I use, mainly a pencil tool, a brush tool, and a binary tool. We're going to go over the binary tool first, just because it's the simplest. The binary brush is mostly just used for pixel art because it has no feathering on the edges. Feathering is the effect around a brush stroke where it gets less opaque pixels, which is great for making art look smoother, but pixel art looks messy. Now you may notice that regardless of what setting you use, the eraser always feathers, which sucks for pixel art. An easy fix for this is pressing that little button up there or the dash key on your keyboard to switch to a transparent brush. This actually works for every tool, and it's great because it has the same effect as the tool you're using, but it works with transparent pixels. It's a perfect eraser for the binary tool, and I also personally use it a lot while I'm shading. Next, we have the pencil tool. I mainly use pencil tools for lining and color blocking. The size selector determines the maximum size the tool can reach. Underneath it says minimum size, which you only need to worry about if you work with pressure sensitivity, like if you have a tablet. If you are working with a tablet, make sure to select it in the advanced settings under the brush. 
Same goes for density. The density slider sets what the max opacity of the brush can reach, so 100% would be completely opaque and anything less would be less opaque. I like to have it set to 100% for color blocking, 90% for line art, and 50% or so for sketching, but it's really entirely up to personal preference. Those little lump icons at the top of most brush menus are how hard the brush is or how much it'll feather. I usually have it set to the third option for most things, except color blocking and erasing, which are set to the last option, but again, this is entirely personal preference. And then we have the brush tool. It's very similar to the pencil tool, except these extra settings down here. Blending affects how much it will pull the colors underneath around, as opposed to laying down its own. So having the blending set low means it'll just lay down its own color, whereas having the blending set high means it'll pull around the other colors already on the layer. The best way to understand dilution is to think of it as adding water to pigment, like with paint. So low dilution just gives you the raw pigment with high opacity, whereas high dilution is very watered down with low opacity. I'm not entirely sure what persistence means, but I believe it's how far it can pull a color. So having persistence set low means it wouldn't pull other colors very far before reverting back to the brush's set color, whereas having a high persistence would pull the colors further. To make a new brush, just right click and select the brush type you want. You can also right click to delete or rename the brush. I generally tend to stick to three brushes though, my pencil brush, which I use for sketching or lining, my pencil brush for color blocking, and P. Sherman, my main blending brush. I personally prefer to just readjust these brushes as I need them rather than make different brushes for different effects, just for simplicity's sake. We also have the option to change the shape and texture of the brush. Here are all the brush shapes. They tend to show better on a brush tool than a pencil tool in my experience, so I mostly use them for shading purposes. I like bristle and uneven SR for hair, noise and spread for skin, and middle round and X-shape arrow to give everything else texture. Speaking of texture, we also have the options to change the texture of your brush. These work better with line art than the shape tool does, so I use it whenever I want to add a textured effect to my line art. As you can see, there are a lot of textures, so my best advice would be to play around with what works best for you. You can also download more textures if you so desire, but the process is a little more complicated than I have time to go into in this video, so I'll see if I can't find a guide on it and link it down below. An important thing to keep in mind is that the texture doesn't change sizes with the brush. We also have the paint bucket, which, like with any digital art program, can cover a large area in one color. Size paint bucket only works in flat colors, but if you would like to add some texture to a large area, you can set the select or deselect tool to the texture you want and then bucket it in. The bucket can either differentiate where to fill based on transparency or color difference. Transparency is divided into two different categories, strict or fuzzy. I believe strict is more precise, whereas fuzzy is smoother, but I'm not entirely sure. You can choose whether the bucket will fill based on the active layer or the whole image as well. Anti-aliasing is part of that whole feathering thing I was talking about earlier, so if you bucket with it on, it will feather, and if you bucket with it off, it won't, and I prefer to leave it on with most art. Melody, you say in that sweet little voice of yours, I'm tired of all this technical talk, can we just talk about color? Heck yeah, we can. So here we have our color menu, and as you can see, there are a lot of options to play with. The first is your basic color wheel, where you can adjust the hue with that outer wheel and the value and saturation with the square in the middle. It's definitely the easiest color option to use. Next we have the RGB, or red, green, blue slider, which lets you pick colors based on how much of those three colors it has in it, but I find it a little overcomplicated and redundant compared to the color wheel, so I don't generally use it. Next we have the hue saturation value sliders, which again are a little redundant with the color wheel, but I still like to use them to pick colors a little more precisely. Then we have the color mixture, which is actually a cool little doohickey where you can put one color into one box, another into the other, and it will generate a slider where you can pick any mix of those two colors. I honestly didn't realize this was a thing until I was trying to figure out how it worked for this tutorial, but I could see a lot of potential for this for shading or coming up with color schemes. Next we have the swatches option. You shift click to lay a color down and then you can select the color again whenever you want. You can also control click to move a color around or drag it off the palette to delete it. I generally only use this when I'm doing palette challenges, but I've seen other artists use this as a place to keep their skin tones or color schemes they want to use. 
Finally, we have a scratch pad, which is honestly the most useless menu in the screen as far as I am aware. I guess it's a place where you can test brushes or whatever, but you can't select any colors from it or anything, so it's kind of useless. On the same note of colors, we have the filter tab up at the top. Here we have two options, hue saturation and brightness contrast. I find the hue saturation screen is the best for editing colors in digital art, whereas brightness contrast is good for editing photos of traditional art, especially black and white images if you want to make the line art crisper. Enough color talk though, let's get back to layers. I've already gone over the line art layer and tools for the regular layers, but there's a third icon, the folder option. Folders are a great way to keep all your layers in order, but also any of these handy dandy effects you apply to your folder will also apply to the layers inside. What are these effects, you ask? Firstly, we have this little box up here. If you tick Preserve Opacity, all colors on the layer will remain the same level of opacity regardless of what you do to them. Here's my blending with the Preserved Opacity turned off and Preserve Opacity turned on. You can, in theory, just use the Select tool, but you do run the risk of pulling transparencies from outside the selection in, meaning your colors won't stay opaque. Next we have clipping groups. Setting a layer to a clipping group means that anything done to that layer will only show up within the bounds of the layer underneath. You can apply as many clipping groups as you'd like to one layer, but you can't apply clipping groups to other clipping groups unless you use folders. Now to get into modes. It took me ages to understand how they work, but using modes has honestly made it so much easier to color and shade. Plus you can use it to apply textures to your art. All modes make layers sort of transparent in that you can see colors underneath, but it doesn't actually affect the transparency of the colors themselves, if that makes any sense. First we have Multiply, which makes dark colors darker, and it's great for shading. It's also really useful if you want to use traditional art as light art, because light colors won't show up with Multiply, so you won't be able to see the white of your page over your colors. Screen makes colors much lighter and very desaturated. Its effect is stronger with lighter colors, but you can get some very gentle lighting if you do use a darker color. Overlay is the most effective way to apply patterns, but it can also be used for soft lighting or shading, or just adding a bit more color to your picture, depending on what colors you use. Luminosity combines the color above with the color underneath and takes it to the lightest value. It's good for very intense highlights. We also have Shade, which is a little more intense than Multiply. Next we have Lumi Shade, which combines the Luminosity and Shade tool. It keeps the color's hue but changes the value and saturation depending on whether a color is lighter or darker than the one underneath. I also use it a lot for intense highlights, especially when I want to keep the color of the highlight the same. Finally, we have the binary tool, which turns off the anti-aliasing for the layer and also makes the color black for some reason. I don't use it very often, to be honest, but I think it could be useful if you want to turn traditional liner into pixel art. I'm not really sure what it's for. A couple quick bonus things about modes, if you apply a mode to a layer and put it in the folder, the mode will only affect other layers in the folder. If you want the mode to affect layers outside of the folder, you'll have to set the entire folder to that mode. You can also apply modes to brushes themselves, but I don't mess around with that a lot, so I'm not super sure how it works. Last thing on the layers menu, we have paints effect. Here you can apply a texture to an entire layer. You can even adjust the size and intensity of this texture, which is nice. There's also the fringe tool, which applies a dark outline to your layer. I don't use this for more complex outlines, but it works for simple things like words or like the columns on my biker painting. Don't like how a specific thing looks? There's a nifty transform tool that'll let you warp your layer. You can press Ctrl T or just click the Square Select tool to access it. You can pull any of the squares to change the size, and if you press Shift while pulling your corner square, you'll be able to preserve the dimensions. Free to form lets you really warp the layer as needed, and it's great for playing with perspective. Speaking of perspective, there is a nifty perspective slider that works along with the free to form to push and pull the perspective further or closer to you. Okay, we're almost done. I just have a few more quick fire tips to speed up your workflow. If you press Ctrl and click on a layer, it'll select everything you've drawn on that layer. 
Want to make the selection bigger? Click on the layer menu and press increment to increase the selection by one pixel. Do this until you're satisfied. Inverting the selection will select everything outside of your initial selection. Pressing D deletes everything in your selection and pressing Ctrl D deselects everything. Keyboard shortcuts are everything. Right click will select and unless you're a dummy like me and recoded it to a different key. The dash key switches to transparent brushes. Parentheses changes density by 10%. Brackets scrolls through the brush sizes. And you can rebind your keys by going under others, then keyboard shortcuts, and switching it there. You can press the windowed key on the canvas itself, not Psy, to see more projects at once, which is great if you need a rough sheet. If you need an image on your canvas, I won't let you open other images as layers, but you can open it as its own canvas and Control c Control v and you're good to go. Also, there's these two little arrows up here. Those will invert your canvas so you can look at it mirror to see all your mistakes. Yay! And that is all my knowledge, which I've now passed on to you. Now go forth and make all the beautiful art your hands can muster. Or... Ugly or whatever, I'm not the boss of you. But in all seriousness, that is all I have for this video. As I've basically been trying to teach myself all this as I go along, I'm sure I've missed a lot of things about Psy, so feel free to let me know in the comments your favorite Psy tips. I'd also love to know if this tutorial was actually helpful, or if it's all just dumb baby stuff that only dumb babies don't know. And hey, maybe if this tutorial was helpful, you could click that nifty little subscribe button. I do make new videos every week, so you know. <laughs> But that's all I have for this video, so thank you so much for watching, and hope to see you next time. Bye!